I'm Cheryl Leo Gwynn. I don't think of myself as an artist, but rather as a creative or even an explorer, because I just create things and I look around to see what's going on. Navigating an underground world with a rabbit was my earliest experience with surrealism. The story of Alice invites me to examine a world of opposites where I create mental exercises for pure amusement or for serious contemplation. My work immerses me in parallel worlds of opposites, opposites in culture, politics, religion, justice, gender, and other aspects of being human. Today, I continue chasing the rabbit to incredible places, creating new work from low-tech materials to high-tech digital assemblages, animations, and the yet-to-be-discovered. There's no particular order to the images that I'm presenting, but rather I group them according to type of work. I was trained as a metalsmith at the University of Washington, where I studied under John Marshall and received both my BFA and my MFA. This piece is made of sterling silver that has been forged and chased. The green elements that you see are carved acrylic that's been sandblasted. This piece is a pendant that's made of, guess what, rabbit fur. So um, I took little strips of rabbit fur and then I wound them around a dowel and tied them so that it became these little puff bundles. And then I stuffed them into these funnel shaped um, pieces of metal and it, they turned out to be this fan like shape that reminded me of like kind of like the Egyptian fans and I really like that shape. So you'll see this um, in a number of my pieces. This is called Where Spring Is Gone. Um, <clears throat> most of my work is narrative, so the titles are a great point of departure for the viewer. Um, again, there's no timeline to the work um, being grouped according to these loose categories. Um, this includes the tufts of rabbit fur, um, photo etching and photo enameling, sterling silver, cloisonne enamel, sandblasted acrylic, bronze, and pearls. This is the front and the back of the piece and the little shutters open and close. This piece is called Sleep Now and it's obviously a cradle. Um, it's about 24 inches long at the uh, its longest dimension. It's made of pewter that's been chased um, lined with resin to make it stiff. Um, the legs are bronze. The spine and the wings are carved uh, plexiglass that's been sandblasted. The heads are found objects in porcelain and the cradle itself is lined with satin. The next are uh, some of the public artwork that I've done. This is the World Financial Center in New York. Um, it was a big commission by Edwin Schlossberg, that was Carolyn Kennedy's husband and his partner, Olympian York. Um, these, the medallion on the left is um, almost four feet by four feet and was created out of a quarter inch plate copper. Um, and then the medallion on the right, that was much smaller, that was like 10 inches. And we did maybe about a little over a hundred of those. Um, that were uh, shipped back and forth overnight um, between firings. Uh, there was, like, money was no object for this. Everything was gold-plated, including the nuts and bolts and the backing plates. Um, this is uh, called the Shrine of Hopes and Wishes. It's on Beacon Avenue South and South Rose Streets, across from the Van Asselt School. Um, this was created as a shelter for the people who were on their way to catching a bus and the community wanted something that was 
peaceful and uh, they felt protected. This is called the Bridge to Brotherhood and it's a 30-foot mural part of uh, King County's Art Against Racism project. Um, the lower image are the uh, center panels of the larger mural and if you look on the bridge itself um, it looks like there's a gray texture of bricks. Those are actually photographs um, that I fired onto the porcelain enamel and they're pictures of the early immigrants that came into Redmond. Um, underneath the bridge you see the symbols of hate that are being swallowed up. Um, this is for the food bank in Bellevue and they wanted a donor wall but they wanted a piece of art and a piece of art that would make the people who came to get food feel somewhat secured and cared for. So I created this quilt out of um, uh, four different kinds of granite. This piece is called Transitions and it was made for the transition um, transitional housing in Bellevue. Um, it's where they chose the families most likely to succeed to live there and they supported them until they were ready to launch um, and then the next family would move in. Um, this is like eight feet of stained glass. This piece is called Step to Tomorrow and it was for the Adele Maxwell Child Care Center that was um, supported by Bill Gates. Um, the, the center is named after his grandmother and they wanted a piece that was touchable, that was approachable for both children and adults, so I created kind of a story. This is porcelain enamel and it's about six feet um, by two feet. This is a piece called First Marks. It's part of the Washington State Arts Commission's um, public art collection and I worked with a community who was a transient one and they said what they wanted their children to have something they could take their pictures with and remember the school. So I created this piece using a pencil, a crayon, and a brush um, because these are the tools a child uses to make their first marks on the world. The ruler that holds them all together acts as their guide. It's about eight feet tall. This is a public art piece which was done in collaboration, but it commemorates the landmark case that allowed Chinese and eventually non-Christians to testify in court. It sits outside the second judicial courthouse in Albuquerque. In designing this, we decided that the image of the scales of justice that are normally associated with justice was just too literal. I remember playing with a gyroscope and was fascinated by its motion and balance. So we decided on a plumb bob, which is a metaphor for the scales of justice. It spins in circles and eventually finds its center or equilibrium. This piece is 16 feet high by 25 feet wide by 25 feet deep. This one is called The Dragon's Garden and it was probably my very first public art piece. Um, it was for the Wing Luke Museum. This depicts uh, the bottom half of the mural which was 12 feet long by about 4 feet wide. The museum wanted something that represented their multicultural constituency and so I used um, the symbols of Asia, but on the dragon, um, if you look carefully, on the belly of the dragon there's a shadow, and those, the shadow is made up again of photographs of the immigrants in the community, and they've been fired onto the porcelain enamel. The Notion of Painting and I'm saying the notion of painting is because, as I said, I was trained as a silversmith and not as a painter. So these are my first attempts at trying to paint. 
This is called The Arrival of the Tulip Heads. It's probably my first serious painting. Um, and the notion of painting kind of frightened me, and the idea of having to paint a face um, was pretty intimidating to me as well. So I did various things to um, substitute for a face. And the tulip heads um, often covered the eyes. This is a small piece. It's acrylic on tin. And painting on tin is really a really nice material to, to paint on. But it was hard to find um, material as I wanted to, to work bigger. This piece is called In Advance of the Rains. And um, this is an interesting piece in that it's the result of a lot of experimenting with different um, mediums uh, for carrying the enamel, with the different oxides that would bear the same temperatures. Um, and I wanted to make uh, something that was similar to oil paint. So, um, oil painters could use the material. So this is like the first piece that was created from that material. Um, I did some dumpster diving and got lucky and came up with um, some of these horses that were four by four feet out of um, quarter inch plate steel. So I retrieved them and I did a play on the four horses of the Acopalypse. It was a very short play um, on the four horses because the only thing about the uh, statement is that they're flying horses. Um, everything else is kind of experiments with light and color and culture. And the same with this one. I really wanted to think about what light would do as it traveled across a figure and especially when it was juxtaposed to the darkness around it. And again you see the tulip head. Tulip heads. Um, this one is called After the Prom. Um, this one was for my daughter because it's like well after the prom guess what you get dishes and dirty diapers. This one is um, probably about five feet tall. And this little piece, it's like really small. It's about 10 inches by 10 inches, if that. And what this, this piece really is about, it's about the background. Um, I tried to simulate um, enamel on foil. And so I used a gold metallic gesso and used um, uh, acrylic glazes to um, kind of simulate. And I think it, it came out pretty um, successfully. This piece is entitled Broken Heart. In creating this piece, I wanted to juxtapose the malleability of clay with the rigidity of copper and the fragility of vitreous enamels and the vulnerability of silk. The shoe is a men's size 13 shoe, so it's fairly large. I wanted it to dance on the heart, so I modeled it after Fred Astaire's shoe, complete with spats. I'm a sucker for those old 1930s romance movies. This one is entitled Don't Fence Me In. Um, so again, it's a ceramic shoe um, that's kind of corralled in um, rose thorns. Um, but I allow the shoe to escape because it sprouts wings. This is a ceramic piece. Um, I took a class from Carol Guthrow. She taught me how to do drop mold. And I created this hollow form. And then I went to um, Ken Turner's uh, class in DigiPen, and he showed me how to use the China paints. 
and so I completed the piece um, in his class. It's called The Birth of Venus, and it all, all actually has kind of like a little rattle inside. This is about eight inches. This was called Beyond My Reach, and at the top you see a bronze hand um, clawing itself through the rose thorns to try to get to paradise over on the left, while one of the hands is not quite making it. This one's doll face. This is, um, I think it's about five feet by three feet, something like that, in cloisonne enamel. And this is when I landed in LA to teach, and it's kind of how I felt. And it reminded me of, of the female impersonator Divine, who was just outrageous, and I found LA outrageous. This is porcelain enamel. It's surrounded by rose vines. Um, it's called Leaning Up Against the Night, and it's about my son leaving home. And this is my doll's house. And I wanted to kind of turn a doll's house on its head. Um, and so my daughter had a miniature doll house at the time. So I created this doll's house, but I put the human being on the inside and the doll in control looking from the outside. This one is Tulip Heads in Print. And this comes with interesting story. I got a um, residency uh, at Centrum, and at the time, I really didn't know that it was a printmaking workshop. They handed me the keys. I saw it was a printmaking workshop, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not real fond of printmaking. So um, I went back home to my studio, and I etched a piece of copper plate. Um, they said that once the plate was printed, you had to strike the plate means you have to destroy the plate. So I cut it in four pieces so it couldn't be printed again and further made it uh, unprintable because I enameled it and gold plated it. Um, this piece is probably about maybe 18 inches tall by uh, two feet wide. This is called Iron Tulip Head. Um, this is um, a formula that I had created to uh, be able to paint color onto cast iron. When everybody told me you can paint three colors in um, on cast iron, like Henry Ford, it would be black, black, and black. So I managed to create some formulas um, where it just wouldn't burn off. This is a small piece, about, about eight and a half by 11. Dioramas. I love making dioramas. And the reason I do, it's like I feel like I can enter into it and become a part of the theater. I can walk in, I feel like once they're made, I can walk into it and become a part of it. Um, at the time, uh, my husband and I were collecting vintage photographs, so I used a process that I discovered. Um, to enable myself to uh, print photographs onto porcelain enamels, fire them, and they'd be permanent. These pieces are all about 15 inches. This is the birthday, and if you look at the background, I was experimenting with ceramic decals, and so the lower part of that wall are ceramic decals. These are all, all just frontal views of um, three-dimensional pieces. No eating, no drinking, and no tap dancing. And this one, you know, it's like a theater, and I felt like I could actually walk into it and become a part of it. The Moon, the Stars, and the Flim Flam Man. This piece is a bigger piece. This one's probably about two feet by two feet, something like that. Um, and this is my mother's cautions telling me about the the moon, the stars, and the flim flam man, and don't believe the promises you get. Um, this one I love. Um, 
This is uh, called the Altered Heart. And with this one, again, I have the rabbit fur. And I feel when I made this piece like I could actually walk up to the, the altar and pick up the heart, which I carved out of uh, laminated um, red transparent acrylic. This one is called Two by Two, and it's about pears. Um, and uh, on the lower part, that orange part, that's actually a beehive with two little bees on it. And underneath, um, there's like a little clear box. You can't see it, but there's an actual beehive under there with more ceramic bees. Um, you'll notice on the, the two posts on the outside, again, these are not, are not the rabbit fur, but they're... They resemble those Egyptian fans, and I put those wherever I can. This one's called A Magician for Harry, and um, I read a book called Bitter Wind, and it was about um, a Chinese dissident who was uh, captured and put in jail in China. He escaped, he came to the United States, he went back with 60 Minutes, they did a documentary, they captured again, and I thought, Harry needs a magician. So I created this piece um, for Harry. Gave him an airplane, a magician with, you know, clapping his hands. Gave him some food because there's one of those, these boxes uh, filled with rice. The flip side of it is what we were doing in America when he was being tortured. This one is called Beyond the Shadow of a Doubt. Um, this is for the kids and for myself where we are very sure of ourselves as we're living our lives. And here's um, an Ode to Peas and Carrots. And like I said um, on the, one of the previous pieces, there's this box that I filled with different things like rice. And this one has... Um, um, split peas, I've, I filled some with flower petals, candy. The carrots on the bottom are glass and I bought those from Nadine Korea. And this one is called And They Kept On Coming. This um, piece is about uh, immigration but it was also a maquette for a public art piece. Um, it addresses the trafficking of women and girls. And an aerial view, you can see these little boats going through a gate and that symbolizes the little girls that had been trafficked. Um, these boats are actually drawer pulls that I filled with red rice. One of the boats has one grain of white rice on it, and that that's, uh, symbolizes the one who succeeded um, and uh, escaped the trafficking. This one's called No Strings Attached, and um, the puppet has been released from the Puppet Master. Um, this piece I really like the clouds are made of uh, screen door mesh. Um, the hands are cloisonne enamel, and the uprights, the that again are the Egyptian fans. Those rods are actually part of a toilet tank assembly. It holds up the float in the old toilet tanks. This is called the myth of the glass slipper. And um, this I uh, call the Cinderella complex. So the glass slippers are old shoes made of lead. The U.S. Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 to 1943 was the first legislation based purely on race. The legislation affected my ancestors, it affected my family, and it continues to reverberate into our lives today. 
While it was lifted in 1943, it was not enforced until the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This legislation and its effects has served as the point of departure for much of my work, from a historic as well as a personal perspective. I've provided images of those whose lives were impacted by the legislation. The U.S. Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first significant restriction on free immigration in U.S. history. Men from China left their families and came to build the railroad and to search for gold in California. The men lived together in meager shelters forming bachelor societies or lives for the most part without women and family. In acts of extreme racism, the white population used a labor movement as an excuse to persecute the Chinese and created the Exclusion Act. One of the critics of the Chinese Exclusion Act was the anti-slavery, anti-imperialist Republican Senator George Frisbee Hoare of Massachusetts. He described the act as nothing less than the legalization of racial discrimination. Using the legislation, the country began to slowly remove the Chinese from the country, burning them from their homes, legally murdering them, and driving many underground to live in safety. While the legislation ended in 1945, the effects reverberate through modern times. George Frisbee Hoare was the only senator at that time to voice opposition to the act. And I just, you know, discovered um, my grandmother's um, photograph accidentally and found the first uh, gener generation of our family who immigrated um, to America during the mid-1800s. And the next generation was um, my grandmother and grandfather uh, who um, were married somewhere uh, around 1900. And this is their wedding picture. And then this is my, that same family, a few years later, and my grandmother ended up with six children, uh, five children, with one on her way when her husband died. Um, so my grandfather was English-speaking and a successful businessman. He insisted that the Chinese could assimilate into white society he and his brothers were the early promoters of civil rights for the Chinese. There's a series of paintings that I did more recently. Um, this one is called No Sense of Place. I was raised on Beacon Hill when it was mostly uh, a white demographic. I was too white to be Chinese and too Chinese to be white. So um, she's falling, and there's all these cultural symbols that's uh, keeping her off balance and um, not giving her a place to land. But with this painting, when you flip it over, turn it upside down, she's actually reaching for the cake. Um, this is called Mr. Peanut's Adjustable Ceiling. Um, so they're all the symbols of the glass ceiling. So there's Asian um, versus Caucasian when you see the two little um, images sitting beside her. So the Cupid doll from the circus and the uh, ancient Chinese sage. Uh, all of these symbols of hope and effort meet opposition. So when you see the um, lipsticks, they get smashed against a glass ceiling that is adjusted as she moves forward. This one is called The Goddess of Mercy, and this um, one is a story um, about a woman who lived upstairs um, when we were little. Uh, her mother was very religious, and she was a friend of my parents. Well, one day there's a knock on the door, and here's this woman asking my mother for some food because she's pregnant, and she can't let her mother know and she's moving away. Well, my, she ended up living with my 
parents and my mother was the goddess of mercy. This one is Dog Days. This one is just kind of like a fun piece, but yet um, it's tongue in cheek. Um, so the, the trained puppies are attached to this horizontal pole and the girl is also uh, entwined to the pole by the vines on her wrist. And the male control and the, the male god rides in on his bunch of bananas. This one is called Squash. These paintings are all about 30 by 30. Um, this is about immigration. So the kids on the bottom are Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Native American. And they're hiding under these leaves. And then there's this hand um, near the girl's head. You don't know if it's an ominous hand, if it's, it's um, harmful, or if it's going to be helpful. This one's, I pro never promised you a rose garden. And it, I'm questioning, what, are you, what were we doing in the 1960s and 70s here and in China? In China, there were teenagers starving and using their art to fight for freedom. In the US, we were fighting for civil rights through our art, poetry, and music. This one is called No Applause. Um, so this is a woman who works in factories uh, doing sewing. She's surrounded by traditional women's things, but she can't escape. If the male hands clap, she's done for. She'll be flattened. Shea paintings. Those um, are my very most recent ones. This is... Uh, called Forgotten Fathers. When I was in China the first time, I heard a story of how the concubines were put out to pasture um, when they got old and they were never seen again. Um, but this one also is about uh, trafficking of women and girls. So under the lip of the moon um, are boats that are filled with um, baby girls that are being trafficked. This one is called golden lilies, and the golden lilies are uh, a term for the bound feet of the women. I'm not a fan of um, beauty pageants, so the sash is replaced by a railroad track. And in the upper left-hand part of the, the body, you see um, the houses that are burning, and the Chinese are fleeing for their lives. And then on the left side, if you look just um, to the left of the wrist, there's a blue gun that's hiding. And um, there's the sash as it continues, shows people hiding behind their curtains and not helping. This is called One Child Policy. And you all probably know that the children, the communists did not allow the um, anybody to have more than one child um, and as a result the the baby girls were hung on in baskets on a wall for anybody to take and you can see that in the middle figure towards the bottom and this one is called Marilyn and Mao and it's about beauty, beauty power and charisma. They all have commercial value. And Marilyn had that kind of commercial value as did uh, Mao Zedong. This one is called Twin Acts. And it's about two Chinese exclusion acts that occurred simultaneously one in Canada and one in the United States. It happens that I was born in Canada to a second generation Chinese Canadian mother and a third generation Chinese American father. As a result of the two 
Chinese Exclusion Act, our family was separated for the first five years. This one is homage to Hazel Ying Li, and um, these are paper mache figures. Um, uh, and, and Hazel was the first Chinese American women's air service pilot. She was qualified to fly jet fighters during World War II. Um, when she approached the Army, um, the U.S. Army, they said, yeah, you're great, you know, um, pilot, but we're, you can't fly for the military because you're a woman. So she decided to go to China because China was our ally during World War II. And she says, well, that's okay. I'll go pl fly for the Chinese Army. So she applied there, and again, she was turned down only because she was a woman. Digital, digital collages are what I'm um, doing mostly right now. Um, and what I do is I've got 50 years of artwork, and not all 50, 50 of the pieces are great. So I've taken them and scanned them into Photoshop, and I've um, isolated um, some parts of them and created an inventory of uh, my images and I bring them together as digital collages to make a new statement. This one's called Bound Foot Ballet. And the foot on the left is being held to a chair um, by the rose vines. And the girls that you see uh, in the background, their feet are bound. This one is a res result of Mao's great, great leap forward. Um, he created a famine in China at the time, and the girl is an old woman who tells the story of starvation. Therefore, the rice man doth not cometh. Shadow Man. Um, this is another digital collage. The purple shadow was cut from purple acrylic. Um, I photographed it outdoors to capture the clouds and trees and flowers that re were reflected in it. And then a photograph um, of uh, one of my ancestors was superimposed on top, and then I collaged them all together. These um, are four oversized prints. Um, I received a grant from uh, For Culture and uh, to create um, digital collages. These are 48 inches in the longest direction by three feet high. Um, you'll see some of the images that you've seen before in previous pieces. Uh, and again, I've isolated them and recombined them to create new work. This is called Double Exposure, and this is about the uh, women who were brought to China, um, brought from China to the United States. Um, they came to find husbands, but in the end, they were really kidnapped and sold. And this one's called Everyone's Charlie. The Chinese men came to seek their fortune but most just lost their identities. There were no records of their names. There were no payroll records for the um, railroad workers because they were paid in cash. So everybody's just called Charlie and their, their names were um, too hard to remember um, in the white community. And this these are all Americans. Uh, Two second-generation American girls, my grandmother's sisters, went to China in 1920 to visit their family with their father and their four brothers. Um, upon return, the boys were allowed return entry, but the girls were abandoned in China because of the U.S. Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, they could not enter. They were trapped there until they died.
This piece is for the Japanese American Remembrance Trail. Um, this is a detail piece and is a part of the public art project that is currently being installed in front of Inscape. It's the old Immigration and Naturalization Services building near Uwajamaya in the CID. This is a vintage photograph of strawberry farmers um, and it depicts the tradition of sending bones and ashes back to China and Japan. A poem about the concentration camps by W. Todd Koneko is superimposed on it. A silhouette of his son and his toy dog look on. A little girl cries. The most recent adventures with my rabbit has led me to animation. Animation seems like the most natural next step in the evolution of my work. Thank you for following the rabbit in me. I hope you enjoyed the journey. And thank you so much for coming.